I'd like to just um, introduce uh, our office shortly, of course. And um, for our second book, I made this uh, humoristic film poster uh, showing the three founding partners of Zebra. And the main point is that we've known each other for a long time. Actually, I've known uh, Kolya for 27 years, and I've known Karsten for 30 years, because we met in high school, and way before architecture, we decided that we wanted to do something fun together. It could have been film, it could have been music, it could have been a number of things, but uh, it ended up being architecture, and so today, I work with my two best friends every day in the office, and uh, what more can you ask for? And then recently, we added to the team the fourth musketeer, Mikkel, here. And um, it came about because besides the office that we have in Aarhus, we opened an office in Abu Dhabi, uh, in the Emirates as well. And that came about because uh, of a particular job down there. I'll, I'll actually show it at the end of the lecture. Um, and so it, it was natural to um, include uh, Mikkel into the partner group. So now we are four best friends uh, working together. And as you can see, I photoshopped uh, I photoshopped this uh, disc from Tron into the hand of Collier. So that's another, another skill of his anyway. Now, for this lecture, I just, um, I simply went through our website to find the adequate um, projects that kind of fits this, this theme that you have of small scale and architecture for children. And while doing it, I kind of decided to be a little cheeky and to also show other things. So I have a few uh, children projects in small scale, but I also add other things because I think usually we don't build specifically for children. We think about families more because most children, especially when they are small, they are never really left alone. They're always engaging with adults in one way or the other in kindergarten or in school or with their parents and their family. So the best spaces, they work for children and adults. And the same goes for children films, the best children movies can be watched by adults as well, and the same goes for music. So that's one point I wanted to make. And I also think that talking about small scale, it doesn't make a lot of sense if it's not related to other kinds of scales and a diversity of scale. And often we never work with just one kind of scale in our projects. We usually work with a number of scales at the same time. So anyway, I started with 10 projects and I ended with seven uh, because I, I tend to talk way too much. So I think that was more adequate. And the first one is, is probably the most relevant project. Now, this is a children's home or an orphanage. So this is a, a home, basically a private home for children of parents who cannot take care of them, either because they are alcoholics or drug abusers or maybe they are in prison or whatever. And the normal thing to do in Denmark is to take these children and place them with a foster family. First of all, it works the best for the children. And secondly, it's cheaper for society, so it's a win-win situation. But a very small group of children, tiny group of children, they cannot work uh, with a foster family. They need professional care 24-7. Uh, uh, some of them uh, have been abused and they've become abusers themselves, so they can't really be left uh, alone. Some of them are violent. They have different kinds of issues and they need a lot of support. And for these kids, you have to have a children's home we want to get rid of children's homes because it's an old-fashioned way of dealing with, with orphans, but we have them for a very tiny group uh, of, uh, of children. So most architects never build a children's home in their entire career. It's a very unusual thing to do. Um, and this building is for these kids, and this is from the opening. Uh, sometimes uh, I donate my, uh, my watercolors to the clients after the project. And this is hanging, I think, somewhere in the, in the home of these, uh, of these children. And one of the most important things for us when we started out was to say, okay, this is an institution because people are working here. They get paid to work here. But also at the same time, it's a home. And that's kind of a, it's two puzzle pieces that doesn't quite fit together. So we studied, of course, the typologies of architecture in Denmark, or we know them by heart, but there was, this was, was part of the considerations. How do you signal home how do you make a building that everybody looks at immediately and it has all the good vibes from childhood of being a home? You can always recognize a factory or an office building or a church or a sports hall. They kind of, I mean, they don't look the same, but still you kind of recognize these things when you go through the landscape. When we drove here from the airport in Tuzla and to Banja Luka, I mean, I could definitely tell, never having been here before, this is a house 
this is a factory, this is a church, this is a mosque. I, I spotted the mosques immediately, even though I've never seen a mosque with just one minaret. Usually they have four where I go. But anyway, in Denmark, a private home looks exactly like this. And if you ask a small child to draw a house, it will have the pitch roof, it will have the little fence around the, around the plot, it will have maybe a little flag. We have, I don't know what it is with, with Danes, but we are really into our own flag. It's not nationalist, actually. It's more of a romantic thing. But when we have a birthday, we throw around the flags and stuff on it. I don't even know why. I just do it because it's tradition. But anyway, they will draw the flag, maybe a little chimney and so on. So this is what a home looks like. And we kept that in mind, obviously. And another simple thing we did with the 1,000 square meters was to chop it down into small pieces so it doesn't look like a huge building but rather a row of smaller houses or maybe a tiny village that's been sort of pushed together. Um, and this is what it looks like. It consists of four pitch roofs and a number of even smaller, almost playhouse scale buildings attached to it. And obviously this is the garden with a number of playground facilities and so on. So this is just sitting in a normal neighborhood and you see like the Jensen's over here and the Peterson's over here and then you have the children's home and the Jorgensen's and so on down the street. Those are common names in Denmark if you, <laughs> if you don't know. So this is the image of, of, of the building. I know that it doesn't look like a traditional home, but part of the idea was to give these children the coolest building on the street because often when they go to school with normal children who are living with their own parents they don't bring them home to play after school because maybe they are embarrassed to live in an institution so we needed to design a building that was really really cool the coolest building in on the street so they, they would be proud of it and in fact the children were on the jury and I can tell you an interesting story because usually in Denmark when you win a competition it usually has to do with functionality if the functionality sucks, you're out. Beauty comes second for some reason. But this one, it won for the design of the outside. In fact, the plans were quite bad. Not because we we're bad architects, but because we needed knowledge. We'd never designed a children's home before, and nobody ever did. So we had to rework the entire interior of this project to make it work. But the children just liked the image, and they were like, wow, we want this. And the adults listened to it, and then afterwards we had to make it work. Honestly, that's, I mean, it's a short story, and I'm making a point, but that's how it happened, pretty much. Now, on these pitch roofs, you'll find a lot of typical Danish motifs. Uh, for instance, the bay windows up here, that's something you see in Denmark all over. So we are working very much with the comfort that comes through something that people recognize. If you recognize something, you'll feel, you'll feel safe and comfortable in that environment. And then at the same time, of course, we use it in a creative way, so it turns into a new kind of expression. Some of them are flipped upside down. It's a childish thing to do, but this is for children anyway, so it's the right uh, place to do it. Probably in another job, for me, we wouldn't do it. Um, and all of these little additions, all of these little bays and little towers, they have a different function. <clears throat> and some of them actually got uh, other functions that we anticipated. Uh, one of them, which is a little tower, that's apparently a text message for somebody. Um, or an update, software update or something. One of these little towers is actually something that they ritualized in the children's home. So whenever one of the kids have a birthday, they take the child up there and into the little tower and they light a candle, they sing the birthday song and they go down again. I'll show you the birthday tower on there. But that was never our idea, but we just set out these possibilities and showed them, well, these tiny little spaces it can be an intimate place to sleep. Maybe it's just a little space for your favorite cactus that you care for, which is like a caring project for a child to make a plant survive or whatever. Or it can be like a Christmas arrangement or whatever. This is the birthday tower up here. After talking to the municipality, it got, it got a little lower. But that's a different story. It's, it's still there. There it is. That's the birthday tower. This is the, the pitch roof that's flipped upside down. And it's such a, I mean, I love doing these things and it's really infantile and childish. And sometimes when I see it now and I talk about it in front of a crowd, I feel a little embarrassed because it's so silly that it's maybe too silly for a grown up. But um, that's the great thing for us working for children and in children institutions is that you get to do this. 
There's a silly notion in society that when you design something for a, for a child, you can use color, you can use shapes, you can use architectural humor. When you design something for a grown-up, let's say it's an office building or a, an assembly hall, it has to be serious. It has to be gray colors, natural materials, straight lines, which is kind of stupid. So for us, working with children was a way to actually get sort of a channel for all the crazy ideas and the, ch the foolish ideas we get that we just want to do, even though they are indeed infantile. That's the great, that's the great part of it. Um, this diagram tells a lot about what we didn't know when we started working with this. And I've heard today a lot of talk about educating the client, and for sure you educate a client as an architect, absolutely. But the client also educates the architect. Because I know nothing about children's homes. Well, I do now, but I didn't when we started. And the person running this, um, this institution, she's very passionate and she's very knowledgeable and she's worked with this for 30 years. She knows everything. She's seen everything. So I was the student in terms of how these children need to be dealt with. And so one of the assumptions we made in the competition was, why don't we put the small children with the big children? so that the small children can look up to the big children, and so the bigger children can look after the smaller children, and they can have something going, and they can teach each other, it would be great, it would be like having siblings. That was the first thing that we had to change, because it happened so that a lot of the older children, they're actually used to looking after their parents. If you have a mother who's an alcoholic, you will do the shopping as a child, and you will look after your younger siblings. And it means that a lot of these children, they don't have a childhood, they have a lot of responsibility. So when they go here, they want to give them a childhood. They want to take away the responsibility and say, listen, you have to look after one person, that's yourself. We will look after the small children for you. You don't have to do that anymore. So the idea here is to actually divide, separate the bigger children from the smaller children. So the small children, they live over here on the ground in a one floor, and the bigger children live over, live over here in two floors in what is kind of a practice apartment, like a little version of an apartment so they can practice on how to be an adult, learn how to do the laundry, learn to maybe cook a little bit so that they will be ready to live on their own when they grow up and become 18 or 20 years old. And then between those two fa facilities, you have all of the grown-ups doing grown-up stuff. They're looking at laptops here. Um, doing the administration and having the meetings and all of that. So that's one thing we learned to separate them. And then, of course, we placed the older children close to the road because part of this was that the small children need to stay on the facility and on the sort of the, the premises of the children's home, whereas the bigger children, they should practice going out into town and doing things on their own. They should practice on going to sports by themselves or visiting a girlfriend or a boyfriend or whatever they do. And so we placed those close to the road so they can just kind of sneak out. Teenagers like to sneak out without their, their parents knowing it whereas the smaller kids are placed in the middle of the site. Yeah, this is just to show you sort of the, the, basic, the basic layout. Particularly in the beginning of the process, we tried to get rid of the traditional corridor of a, you know, a normal institution that has the corridor. Even in a prison, you have a corridor, and you'll see the guard running down the corridors with this like, stick on the, on the doors you know, to sort of uh, scare the inmates, whatever. But, so some of the pockets that we have here is to eliminate the idea of a hallway, but still, indeed, we do have hallways, which is a bit of a, I mean, it's one of the places where we didn't succeed 100%, but look at them, they're not straight. At least they bend and go back and forth a little bit, so we never have long stretches of hallway. But that's one of the things that you don't see in a house for a family. You don't see a corridor that long, but you see it in an institution. So for us, it's an institutional trade, and we wanted to get rid of it. We didn't quite succeed, but anyway, um, this is the diagram for it. This is what we're actually looking for, something that's pretty dissolved. You have the rooms in here for the children. You have the common facilities out here. This is just to tell you about another thing that we learned from working with the Birgit, which is the name of the, of the woman who is in charge of this, this place. We had all of these elevated areas for the children on, on top, of the, on top of, the, um, of the rooms. And usually, this is perfect with, with so-called normal children. Uh, to have little caves and little nooks, spaces that are so small that an adult won't really go there, private spaces for the kids. And so we had like uh, a lifted loft up here, but that was taken out because the adults in this institution, they need to be able to overview everything all the time. One of the kids were playing with fire, that was his thing. So you have to keep an eye on these kids all the time. They're not bad, they're not bad people, 
They just have problems and issues. So you can't have little corners and little nooks like you can in a normal kindergarten. Here you need overview, and that actually changed the design uh, quite a bit. And that's also what partly, you know, made it more institutional. So, I mean, the two, uh, the two uh, puzzle pieces, they still don't quite fit together, but they fit better now with our project anyway. So some things you just, you kind of, you can't fix. So these kind of spaces that are, I mean, nice, generous, and well-lit spaces, they kind of were left with, with this motif in the end, and they look like this now, which is super fine compared to what they came from. They had a really shitty building, uh, but still, it's, if you aim really high, you still end up pretty high. So still, you know, put up your ambitions to 100% and then you're still gonna make something that's really nice. Now, this is the first project that we did in the Emirates in Abu Dhabi. Um, well, actually, only this part is the project. The rest is just other things. Um, and it's called the Early Childhood Center. In fact, it's a number of facilities put together in one building. And this is exactly an example of the opposite, of something you cannot do in the children's home, because this does have little caves and little nooks and secret pockets for the children. Um, and that's what I'm going to focus on today. I could talk one lecture just about this project, because it took a long time to, to develop it and so on. But anyways, that's what I want to tell you about. And um, it's also, at the same time, an attempt to develop a contemporary Emirati architecture, because Many buildings uh, in the Emirates, this is a young nation. It was founded in 1971, the year I was born, actually. And um, so it's, it's 45 years old as a nation. It's a very young nation. And in the beginning, they imported architecture from the US, for instance, and the West. And it looks Western. It looks, it looks American. Now they are striving for a contemporary architecture that looks modern and, and totally cutting edge and all of that, but has, you know, traits of the Emirati culture and works well with the climate because a lot of the buildings down there are glass skyscrapers which is an insane thing to do in the desert because you need to cool it like hell. You make a hot house then you cool it afterwards, it doesn't make sense. But that's slowly changing now uh, as the nation is beginning to uh, mature and uh, of course uh, remember to, to value uh, the heritage of the country. So this kindergarten was our first attempt with our client who is a, a brilliant person uh, to develop an Emirati kind of architecture. So we based it on the courtyard house, which is very typical for this area. They will build a perimeter, basically a fence, and within the fence you'll have a number of buildings. This is also a model that we know in Europe, but it's very dominant in this region. And the other thing, obviously, is the tent. And there are two kinds of tents. There are the tents for the females and the tents for the males. This is just a general sort of layout of a tent or dune-type inspired architecture. So those are the main uh, ideas behind the, the overall layout. Um, and that's what actually makes it uh, look like this. So when you look at the plants here, you can see that the perimeter defines a space, which is all of the brown area in the middle. And then you have three courtyards. You have one, two, and three. Those are outside spaces. And connected to the courtyards, you have different little pots. So this pot goes to this courtyard. This pot goes to that courtyard. This pot goes to this courtyard, and the fourth corner is actually additional facilities, because this is not only a kindergarten. It's also a place for teaching. And the people being taught here are future teachers for the children. And it's also parents. So if you go as a parent, you have your first child and something is wrong, you go to lectures about you know, pedagogical issues, cutting edge pedagogical issues, or you go to get lectured on toys or whatever. So there's an auditorium. There's a little shop where you can buy cutting-edge uh, toys de that develops the child in the right way. There's a speech therapist and another, a number of other amenities in that corner. So it's half um, education and it's half kindergarten. It has to do with the fact that there's no real tradition of kindergartens in the UAE. They have some refurbished villas with the, you know, we have daycare uh, centers but they do not have a tradition for actually building kindergartens from scratch, and they do not have a tradition for educating teachers for kindergarten and for toddlers. So that was part of this project as well. And uh, this is the section, obviously, and a late uh, 3D model. Now, one of the things we also did, 
was we tried to shade the building from the sun, and it sounds so stupid because of course you want to shade for the sun. It's a 50 degrees when it's the hottest, 50. And humid too because it's close to the coast. So building any type of glass building doesn't quite make sense. So behind all of these louvers, you will find the windows. And the rest of the light comes through the actual courtyards in the center of the building. These guys here. So it is well lit and well illuminated, but never with direct sunlight. It reduces the amount of cooling that you need to, to make. So obviously it's a much more sustainable uh, solution. And also I find, as a Dane, because we don't have air condition, I dislike air condition. I don't like the feeling that th the effect it has on my body. I don't like to be in air conditioned spaces. When I go to a hotel in Abu Dhabi, I turn it off immediately. I would rather sweat a little bit than, than having the air condition. So that's, that's, that's part of it too, developing an architecture that actually responds to the local climate, which is something most architects, I think, are forgetting now because the international style kind of took that off the table. You had the idea that you could make one style that was international. You just forget about climate because building in Greenland is not like building in the desert. It's just two completely different things. And in former times, the climate was definitely a design driver, and we want to reintroduce that because it's anchoring the building to Abu Dhabi. In this little cross section, you see all of what the building consists of. You see the classroom in here. <laughs> you see the nice tubes and installations up here. You see the courtyards, and you see the common space out there. This is basically what's repeated around the perimeter of the building. The most important thing about this section is actually the bridge up here. I didn't uh, come up with that idea. Actually, it was an idea that came from Yale University because we worked with Walter Gilliam from Yale University, who's an expert on, um, on childhood uh, pedagogical issues. And he had the idea that we needed a kind of a bridge so that teachers can overlook the classroom. So basically, when you stand up here, you can see what's going on in the classroom. And that's very important because when a child actually knows that they're being watched, they will change their behavior completely. Anybody who's ever been to photograph a school will see the children like, like this, you know. When they, when they know you are there, they start doing all sorts of things. So you need to be able to spy, positively spy on the children to get a real understanding on how they behave. And also the parents can go here and they can see your child is having issues with another child and sometimes the parents will deny it and say, no, they don't, my child do not have any issues at all. They can say, why don't you come and look? Why don't you come and study what's going on in the class with us? And they can look at the child and they can think about it when they go back home and maybe change their upbringing or whatever. So it's a very good chance to study what's going on. And also it has to do with how you educate people, teachers for, for kindergartens. Because often what happens is that it turns into something academical. You read a book and then you start teaching the children, which is stupid. You would never read a book about football and close it and say, I'm ready to be a professional now. You would never do that. You would play football to learn how to play football. Then you would record yourself and you would evaluate and you would look at the video of yourself doing maybe wrong movements or stupid runs on the pitch or whatever. You can do that in a, as, a, as a kindergarten teacher too. You can actually film an interaction with a child and you can look at it afterwards and you can say, okay, look at this. When you say, when you use this word, look at the child's face and you actually learn something from this. So that was part of it too. So there's a whole system in this building where you can actually monitor. It's not, it's not about surveillance. It's not a big brother uh, thing. It's about becoming a better teacher. And also it was about connecting to Yale University on the internet and to have you know, activity going across the, across the Atlantic. Now anyway, this is the classroom. Part of what we wanted to do was to make a flexible unit. You could create small spaces within the space for instance, in a kindergarten, the kids will take a nap during the day. They will sleep sometimes for an hour or two. So we wanted to create with these curtains intimate little areas where you can read out loud from a book and have the children sit around and get kind of tired and get ready for sleep like a ritual. In childhood, I think rituals, also for grown-ups, rituals are very uh, important because it creates a kind of a secure feeling for the child that they know what's going to happen. Children love predictability to a certain degree. They also like improv improvisation, but there needs to be some sort of a predictability. And part of it is creating rituals. And so we also, under the stairs, this is one of the stairs running up to the, I'll just show you where it is on the plan. It's all of these stairs going up to the first floor. Under these stairs, we made these little caves and nooks that we couldn't do in the children's home. And this is basically a stair that's going upside down 
So you can lie on your back and play with your feet and, <laughs> and walk upside down, or you can do whatever you want. These are the kinds of thoughts that we have, and then in the real world, the children will use it in a completely different way, which is totally fine. This is um, the upper floor that also had a parents' lounge and the teacher's uh, uh, office space, and we made it look like something that it wasn't an office space at all. This is the main stair. Uh, a theme with animals came across, and once again, it had to do with anchoring the building into the context of Abu Dhabi. So we took some of the typical animals from the region and we turned them into furnitures and staircases and so on. And so for this one, this is just a rattlesnake. It's not a rattlesnake, actually. It's a local snake that's spiraling up like this, and you have the head in the top, and you can crawl inside of the, the head, and you can wave to your mom and say, look, the snake ate me. A little bit like the, the book, you know, from the, the, the Ponce Petit with the snake that ate an elephant. Um, and then we did a lot of these, and actually I think this, um, this guy, uh, Walter Gilliam, said at some point that I had to, I had to uh, see somebody about my idea of these animals kind of eating, people, eating the children. So I stopped at some point and, and, and came up with other ideas. Um, here you see the inner court. So the edge is inside, this is inside, and this is outside. Basically, when you look at it, it's just a traditional number eight structure or perimeter building. Uh, and inside of, inside of these parts, uh, we developed what we call super trees. It came about because the site is rather small. It's a very compact site, so we don't have a lot of green areas around uh, the building. So all of these small little courtyards we couldn't really place anything green uh, on the floor because we would lose a hard surface. We couldn't both have hard surface and green surface, so we elevated, we simply elevated the green surface. So all of the green and natural elements are hanging from the trees, which are in fact steel structures. But the trees also create shade in the courtyards, which is really important. And then they serve also as a wind tower. That's a traditional thing of the region, that you build a little tower and it collects the wind, it bends down the wind into the space and it cools the space simply by creating draft. It's a very simple technique. You make a cross inside of a square or around a cylinder, and that's how it works. So that was the prime function uh, of the super tree in the middle of it. And then obviously, uh, we uh, hung swings from the super tree. We had loudspeakers in the super tree, mist coming out of the super tree, solar cells. So they, per they perform a number of, of, um, of things. And we went even further to start collecting furniture and designing furniture. So it's one of those rare chances we have to just design everything. We do all sorts of things in, in the office. Sometimes we design just the concept design and somebody else screws it up. Sometimes we just design everything and we pick out the furniture and we design. For this building, we even made an alphabet, a font for the, for the building itself. Um, so, so here we took it really far. And as you can see, it's kind of a mix between Emirati colors and Scandinavian design and zebra playfulness and a number of things. And one of the furniture spaces we designed is half furniture, half space, was the lactation booth. I'm going to have to tell you about that because what everybody knows is that lactation or breastfeeding is really important for small children because it's the most nutritious food a child can get at all. Nothing compares to it. So we should. Um, we should try to convince mothers across the world that they should actually breastfeed their child. And so this booth was a private booth where you could go and breastfeed your child. If you were picking up your child and you brought maybe a younger sibling or a brother and a sister, you could actually go in and close the door and you could breastfeed in peace or whatever. And the main point of it wasn't actually for this to be used. I remember Walter Gilliam say, it's not about this being used because I kept saying, well, people go there. I kept asking the local people, uh, the Emirati women, would you ever breastfeed in a booth like that? And, 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 and Walter kept saying, it doesn't matter if it just says lac you know, lactation booth or breastfeeding corner. That reminds people that they have to do it and it's a positive promotion. So it was partly a function and partly a promotional gimmick. And this is the way it looks. Um, this is a seat and this is a little table for your makeup and your iPhone and whatever. So, And these are all of all of the animals that we did, uh, a little whale, a lizard, squid. Uh, and it has the size that you know a child can crawl into the mouth of the whale. And then on the top of it, there's a slide going down on the tail of the whale, so you can climb it too. It's half space, half furniture. And it's the kind of space that 
A grown-up would never, well, I think I might actually crawl in there just for the hell of it. But anyway, a grown-up would usually not climb in there. You still need to be able to fetch the child if the child gets ill or something. You have to be able for safety to get it. But still, it's a very private space. So it's a space where you could take a book and you know that you wouldn't get disturbed by grown-ups, which can be, can be nice sometimes for a little child. And then the idea of local animals spread into the tiles of the bathrooms, and that has to do with when you change diapers, it's nice for the child that they can look at something. Usually parents will hang like a mobile thing in, in, in the ceiling, so when you change the child, they will look at that and not think about what's actually going on. And all of these uh, creatures were, you know, were on the tiles on the walls, and we designed little stupid details like this with a crocodile eating the corner of, of this wall, which is once again an infantile thing, but I, I really dig it myself. <laughs> I guess I haven't grown up. Um, yeah, so the next one here is an example of diverse uh, scales. I've called it a flip-flop method in lack of better words. I think it's a silly, uh, I, I couldn't come up with, it, with anything better. But this is the iceberg that we did and probably the most well-known uh, project that we designed. And it's not a small building, but it has elements of intimacy and smallness within it because it's both big and small at the same time. Um, and it's lying in the harbour area that Trine just showed you before. Uh, Trine's uh, library is in this corner and the iceberg is up here. And this is an old photograph. You can see how this is an industrial harbour and now it's being transformed into housing and offices and public buildings and so on. The school, the engineering school is right here and the library is right here. Uh, so this has already changed uh, quite a bit. And we were given this volume from the master plan. The master plan presented us with this block. And that's a big scale thing because it's one object and it's one space in the middle. Uh, and furthermore, it's very introvert. This is something you would do in a city where you want to create privacy and shield off the space from the traffic and maybe have a quiet green garden or something in the middle. It doesn't make sense on the harbor because you want to open up towards the light, you want to open up towards the views and the water, obviously. So those two drivers were actually all that we had, the, the view to the water and, and, and the sunlight. So it's pretty much what any real estate broker would tell you to do. Very, very simple. The first thing we did was to create these L-shaped structure that opens up to the canal and to the bay. And then we pulled up points and we pushed down points, but in a shifted mode, so that whenever you have a low, you have a high. And here you have a high, you have a low. So they're shifted. It means you can look between the peaks and you get a view to the ocean. The most amazing thing about it was that this was a competition. And in the brief and in the planning uh, regulations, it said that we had to build six floors maximum. And that's where this block comes from, six floors as a maximum. And we said, OK, why don't we build six floors as an average? So we go all the way to one and all the way to 12. And this is six floors. And the great thing about this competition was that we had a chance to actually see the municipality and ask if this would fly. And they loved it. They just completely loved it. So they're like, fantastic, just do it. If we hadn't had the chance to see the municipality, which is often the case in a competition, we would have never done this because you risk so much time and so much money and you might get disqualified in other competitions. You never know. So in, in this uh, respect, we were quite lucky to have the dialogue with the municipality. So anyway, um, we decided to go for the average. And as you see, it works quite well because this is the back row. This is actually the back row of the building. So this is, uh, this is that block, approximately this view. So even when you're all the way back, you have a nice generous view to the ocean. And you can also imagine that a lot of daylight would flow onto this balcony. That's essential in Denmark, I think. Whereas in Abu Dhabi, we shade the sun in Denmark. We want as much as we can possibly get during the four months of summer that we have. And looking back, you get kind of the same uh, impression. You have a depth, and instead of this being one building, it looks like a little, not a village, but a group of buildings. It is actually one project and one, well, it's four buildings, but it has 11 peaks. So it started out as one block, it turned into four buildings with 11 peaks. So even when you see it from afar or from this place, it's broken down into smaller uh, elements, just like uh, the children's home, obviously. And you look back at the city in here and you look back at the forest. And obviously it has a positive effect on the daylight, not only in terms of the amount of daylight, but also the shadow pattern that you get. Because if you look at the initial block here, 
you just get sort of big deserts of shadow. Whereas in the iceberg, the shadow pattern is broken up into little patches. So it's kind of a dappled light of dots, dots of shade and light. So everybody has a more evenly distributed amount of light and shadow, but the shadow amount is the same. And then obviously, this being a white uh, house, it changes quite dramatically with the daylight. Here it almost looks a little pink. And the thing is, people ask us all the time, why did you, why did you want to design an iceberg? And we actually didn't. We designed the peaks for the views and for the daylight. And then afterwards, we agreed that it kind of looks like an iceberg. In fact, for a short moment, we also worked with the idea of calling it Himalaya. Um, because in the harbor front, there are a lot of exotic names referring to the places where the boats would go. But we, we, we ended up with the iceberg, which is quite a cool name. And the, the positive effect, or the, the surprising effect, is that when you do something like that, and your client agrees with the word iceberg, and the builders know that, it's, that they're building an iceberg, then everybody knows right on that it has to be something white, it has to be something maybe bluish, and there's no discussion. Nobody would ever say, let's do it in brick. Any client would say bricks at some point, but here it's just a no-go because you'd have to have glazed white bricks and they cost a fortune, it would never fly. So all of a sudden everybody is aiming for the same thing and you cut out a lot of discussion and you become a team doing an iceberg together. It's quite fantastic actually. To, it's just from the, simple, from the simple idea of just giving it a name. So from that day on uh, it became white and, and saying this today is quite funny because at some point we had this one red and this one in wood and this one in concrete so they actually looked like individual row houses. That was an early stage of the design. Once we decided on the fact that it looks like an iceberg, we had to kind of go, go with that idea. And you see also, of course, in the mist, it changes quite a bit. And this picture particularly shows that some of it is actually lower than one floor. It's as tall as the windows, this corner. Then it rises up to 12. And you also see that the spaces, they are as narrow as the buildings. It's 12, 12, 12, 12, all of it. But the, the reason why it works and doesn't become unpleasant is because the height is shifting all the time. Whenever you go up, you go down on the other side, and then they do like this and like that. So you never have like a shaft of a space. It's always a space that's tall on one side and low on the other. And that's, that's why it works. And there's one other thing that you should notice here is actually this area, which has no function. It's actually for play. It's not a playground, but it's something we put in there so that you can jump from one to the other, or you can play football between these. I remember as a kid, the goal in our, in our yard was just two, two bollards. And that was a fantastic goal for five years <laughs> of football in every, every break. Uh, so these things are actually, they, they work quite well, these really simple things. Or maybe you slalom on your new bike, you slalom between these, uh, these bollards coming out. So sometimes it could be really, really simple. And it doesn't have to be like a stupid pink Disney elephant or something. It can be integrated nicely into the design. And grown-ups can sit and text on these or whatever. Lovers can hold hands. So there's a number of possibilities. And it's just one bollard, quite a simple gesture. And these are the spaces, of course. You can see they are low and high on the other side. You see the shifting. And you see how the daylight plays with the shadows of the balconies that are ice blue, obviously. And that's one interior from one of the top apartments. Now, also on the harbor, we did a project uh, for students. So this is, this is a very cheap project. Um, and it's subsidized by the government and everything. And I, I took this project with me today to show you how we work with the kind of an illusion of scales or kind of messing with scales a little bit. Because this is a rather big and fat building and it's quite, it has quite ugly proportions. And we couldn't really change those proportions because it was from the bit it was, the design was already there because you had a plot. And it was a plot that goes all the way to, to, to where the building begins. You didn't have any land around the building and you had a number of square meters. And when you have the plot and the square meters, you also have a height, pretty much. So we needed to do something with the facade to make it look less lumpy and big and fat and massive. So we just sliced it basically like this. So they became, it started looking like rows of books or maybe tiny little towers, actually. Little, little towers with just one room in each tower. So it's a simple operation like this. You have the block, the atrium in the middle, you slice it and then you push these little sticks up and down to create entrances and technique roofs and roof terraces and so on. And these are the actual plans of the student housing. You see we have different apartments in the different towers, so each, each tower has a different uh, plan layout. For instance, the ones in the corners, here you can live with a, with a, 
what do you call a roommate, and you have a common space and a little kitchen and a bathroom. And this is just for one person, and these, these are for you know, people in wheelchairs. We have one tower that's all for disabled people that are using a wheelchair. So on the facade, it looks like this. You even have different kinds of views, and that does a lot to a small space. If you just change the shape of the window, that would completely alter the atmosphere uh, of, of that space. So it has an effect on the facade, obviously, of scaling it down, but it also has an interior effect. When you go to visit your neighbor, you get a different experience, and you don't feel like you have one of 160 apartments. You have maybe a unique experience, or partly unique experience, in your own house. And so, you, as you can see, it sits right next to the iceberg over here. And this is just, I, I always bring this one because we, we tend to give our client a lot more than what they pay for, always. Uh, not because we are nice, we are also nice, but that's not why we give them more. We give them more because we just can't stop designing, because we're having a great time. So these are the mailboxes, and uh, we just decided to write 2012, because that's when the building was built. And it's one of those stupid things, it doesn't cost you anything. It, it, a black box costs the same as a white box. It costs my time to do the drawing, but I just do a simple stupid hand sketch. It doesn't have to be anything fancy in Grasshopper or Rhino or anything. Just a stupid sketch where I can even just I can even just say it to, to the builders that I want like these mailboxes. So it just adds a bit of, bit more of extra value and we always try to do that with, with little things that makes a difference because when you enter that house you'll notice that somebody actually cared for this space. It's not just a space that appeared, somebody actually gave it some thought. Uh, inside you see this really narrow space. It's quite a narrow tall shaft and so we wanted to do a number of things with it. We wanted to bring down as much daylight as possible to reduce, of course, the amount of, of electricity for artificial light. And that's how we came to think about the mirrors. Um, and then also, we know that when you work with an atrium, you can actually see what's going on on the balcony above you. If you have a traditional dormitory, you'll go down a hall and you have no clue what's going on on the floor beneath you or above you. Here you actually can see the whole building, so you have a better community experience and the people actually see each other. So if you're a young boy and you, you, you have a crush on maybe one of the nice female students, you have a better chance of actually seeing that woman or that girl in this atrium. And that's important because we know for a fact that when people drop out of uh, university, it's never because of the books or the actual, um, the actual learning uh, disciplines. It's always something social. It's always if the people feel that are kind of Maybe they feel lonely or maybe they feel they're not accepted in the group or whatever. It's always a social thing that made people drop out of college. So we need to make these spaces as social as we can and we felt that the whole idea of the atrium was also that and then of course uh, the daylight issues and making a narrow space look bigger. So it actually changes the perception of a chef into an endless infinite space. So it's very small and incredibly big at the same time which is also quite a, quite a nice gimmicky touch if you look down, you get the reflections. If you look up like this, it kind of disappears into a blur of, of highlights and daylight. So it has quite a nice effect. And most people, when they haven't been in the space, they can't even actually read this image. And that was part of our problem because, or well not problem, it was, it was a challenge. The client was very worried about this space. They had the idea that people going into this space would feel sick. Um, so getting the idea was the easy part. Convincing the client to actually build it, that was the difficult part. And this doesn't cost anything extra because you need the glass so people don't fall out into the space. You need that anyway. And you need a double layer because it has to be safety glass. And the foil in the middle can be either transparent or the mirror foil. It, it costs the same. So actually the effort was to convince the client and we were really stubborn. And that's quite interesting because afterwards when it was built, the client actually thanked us and said, thank you for being so stubborn. Thank you for not listening. Thank you for actually just sticking to it because now we understand it. That's our problem and challenge as architects sometimes. We can actually visualize what it would look like and what it would feel like. But as a client, maybe you can't visualize it until it's actually finished. So a lot of the, a lot of the fights we take, we take them because we know in the end, everything will be good. Everybody will be happy. And of course, you see, uh, you see the woman that you're looking for many times at the same time, which is also good. And you see these guys are talking. That's something that happens in this atrium. It actually, I'm quite proud of this because it actually does work. People will be hanging sort of like this and talking to people that are two floors down. 
That's amazing. And they even lower their voice because they know that they shouldn't like disturb the other guys in the in the in the house. So they kind of are you coming to the party tonight? No, I can't make it. I'm sorry. They're like talking back and forth. It's great. They always do that. Um, this is a school, and as you maybe maybe you know, maybe you don't. We've done a lot of schools, and this, but this school is a special one because this is a school for grown-ups. And when we say grown-ups, it's not necessarily people that are 30 or 40 years old. It's also people that are maybe 17 or 19. It's also teenagers. It's primarily aimed at dropouts, people that drop out of elementary or secondary school and they never get an education. So here in the VUC, they have a second chance. They get a chance to actually take a primary or secondary, a secondary school or a high school degree in this building. And therefore, the first thing we decided was that we had to make a building that didn't look like a school at all. Because if you have negative uh, associations with the school, if the school reminds you of failure, of actually dropping out, of not having success, and you go into a building that looks exactly like a school, it's like returning to your early childhood of failure. So we wanted it to look like something else. I think maybe it looks a bit too much like an art museum, but still it certainly doesn't look like a school. And the spaces in there are quite magnificent. It's a simple perimeter again, just like the Arabic, um, the Arabic house. And as it turns out, I think when I started out architecture, I had this idea that I would invent, invent new types of, of, uh, of, of architecture. And as it turns out, you actually kind of recycle things that are thousands of years old, like for instance, the perimeter. And you can keep recycling it forever and t make it your own kind of work. And all of these things, they are about for one reason, they work. <laughs> well, anyway, so it's a traditional perimeter and we add these coins that turn into balconies, and all the balconies are different. They shift all the time. This is what it looks like from the outside. You see the curves cutting back exactly like the interior spaces, and this is actually an art installation. So this is part of, that's what Trine said, you have a certain amount in public buildings for art, and that's integrated into the facade of this building. This is the interior space, and you see it's the same shape, which is an oval that just kind of rotates and it means that the spaces you have in the middle is not really spaces, it's more of an area or a landscape that kind of fluctuates from a dark corner to a bright corner, from a very low area to a double height, triple height, four times height. And that's one of our philosophies with education buildings that we need a diversity of space because we found out that flexibility is about diversity. If you think flexibility is about moving walls and partitions that can open, that's not flexibility. I mean, it is, but people tend to not use it. If it takes five minutes to move this wall, people will not use it. If you press a button, maybe. If it's not too noisy and squeaky and still takes a minute to kind of <laughs> cut across the room, people, they don't like it. It's much better to create an interior space that has many qualities. So if you need to work with a little group of maybe two other students, you'll find a little corner of your own. If you need, as the school uh, principal, to address the whole school, you will find the biggest space. Um, if you want to kiss with your girlfriend, you will find the most dark corner, probably, or whatever. You can always find a place in this space that's adequate for your function, and maybe your mood, or maybe the kind of person you are, because people are different. Some people like big spaces, other people like uh, dark and intimate spaces. I, for instance, really like the sort of the Le Corbusier monk cell, the really telephone booth where you kind of, you know, you, um, you keep out the, the world and you dive into your books and whatever, and other people, they like to sit on a beach. It's, it's, it's about personality, really. And so people are so different, and this, this, the schools should reflect these different needs and these different personalities and different learning styles as well. And people, also children, are quite different as individuals. Children are as different as, as grown-ups. Maybe even more different, because as you grow up, you kind of tunnel into behaving a certain way. So this is the central object in the space, and from this object, you can look around and see all of the facilities that are common, and we place those in the bottom of the building so they offer something to the city. So for instance, the, um, the art class is on the ground floor, the music class is on the ground floor, the sports pit is on the ground, ground floor, and from this, a round staircase in the middle, you can see, you can look into all of those spaces, you can look further out into the city, and when you pass the building, you'll see a lot of these more open and creative activities going on, so it will inspire you to actually maybe walk into the building and it'll give the building a positive sort of um, identity in the community. This is one of the sections, it just shows you that it's darker at the bottom, brighter at the top, 
low, double height, triple height, four times the height. It's a very dynamic space. And still again, it's just the same oval, the exact same oval is just being rotated a couple of times and you have this kind of a space. And it's a very cheap building. It's a turnkey building. And I know it doesn't look cheap, but who cares uh, that it's cheap if it looks fantastic? It is cheap. Uh, it's all concrete elements, which is the standard building uh, method in Denmark. It's all standard cast uh, walls. And of course, the main structure is quite simple and, and boxy. And then whatever is more elaborate goes on on the inside. And then we spend a lot of money on this staircase element in the middle. But still quite cheap materials and the building technique that's really stupid. The ceilings, that's the cheapest ceilings you can get. They're also quite ugly, but I think it's not the main focus here. And so when you build cheaply, you have to focus on what's important. And here, obviously, it's creating the main space, the overall lines. And then a bit of Photoshopping helps as well. <laughs> and inside of the space, we also placed, in this instance, a number of furniture. These furniture are clad with fabric on the inside, so they insulate the sound. So it actually creates uh, very much an intimacy within the big space. So a little bit like the library Trine showed you before, it's a big space with smaller spaces. And then even smaller, you have furniture that's kind of a mix between a furniture and a space. So it's all, it's all the scales mixed together. And I think that's an important point because we can't say that small people, children, need small spaces. They thrive completely in a forest, a big, big forest. If you take children out into nature or a beach, they love it. And that's, those are giant spaces. It's not only about size, it's about other things as well. Um, this is a science center uh, that we built in Copenhagen. It, it just opened uh, a month ago or so. And a science center is a place where children go to learn uh, about science in a fun and entertainment kind of way. And they go there with their parents or their teachers. So it's also a place for grown-ups. And I think most grown-ups would not go alone. Uh, some children might go alone if they're 12 or 13 or 14, but usually they, they go together as families. So once again, it's about looking not only at the child, but at the entire family. And it's placed in the middle of this uh, rather dull area. And this building, this is where we are. That's the old brewery. And the science center was in the old brewery for 20 years, and they needed more space. And we couldn't expand to the side, so we had to build it on top of the old brewery. So this is the old brewery where they used to make soda pops. Um, and this is the new science center that's kind of put on top of it with a number of boxes. And the reason why we work with these boxes is that every box has a different uh, function or a different well, not a function because you can actually change that over time. It's a very flexible building in the sense that those are just open spaces. And the institution, they can change that themselves whenever they want. So I would rather say that the, the different boxes have different properties. Some of them have a lot of daylight. Some of them have daylight from the north. Some of them have no daylight. Some of them are high. Some of them are low. Acoustics, a number of different things. So it's like different elements that the users of the experimentarium can play with uh, and do different things with. You see this one doesn't have any windows at all. It's like a black box for exhibition. This one has a view to the ocean and so on. So the simple, uh, the section is quite simple. You see the old building down here and you see the boxes on top. And then the whole organization is centered around two atriums. There's one atrium here with the helix stair and an atrium here with the scissor stair like that. And then the rest of it is pretty much open spaces. So it's a bit like an art museum in the sense that it's a lot of open halls that are not filled by the architect, but in an art museum, it's filled by the artist here, it's filled by the experimentarium. And then we have two spaces for the architect, where the architect is actually doing um, something special, which are the two atriums that creates a circular flow in the building like that. These are the plans, quite straight, quite simple, and almost, again, a perimeter kind of building with the functions pressed to the side and a big space in the middle. I think it's not only Zebra. I think it's a Scandinavian thing that um, we often work with atriums in our buildings. And we often work with quite confined, boxy buildings with a spectacular atrium in the middle. And I think, I mean, my theory is that it kind of reflects Scandinavian personality because Scandinavians are very quiet and very, not very hospitable, not very forthcoming. We're not very good at making new friends. We kind of keep to ourselves. We don't talk a lot. And when we have people in the office, office from Spain, for instance, we have a Spanish architect now, when she starts talking, everybody's like looking. He says, he has a higher, she speaks in a higher, she's more like, and we're like, what the fuck? 
you know? So we're quite, we're quite the sort of modest, simple people. But then on the inside, something is going on, and that's kind of what the atrium represents, because when you walk into a Danish building, you'll always be like, wow, what a space. You see it from the outside, it's just a great box. You go into, this, go into the central space, and it's just a revelation. And you will see it dating hundreds of years back, and that's, that's the Scandinavian personality. And it's the same with this building. It's quite closed and boxy, and the atriums on the inside are quite fantastic. The old building here, the new boxes on top, you see this fluid dynamics that represents science, fluid sciences that's developed with the client, actually. You see the cantilevers of the stack boxes. You see the different kinds of terraces that will also be exhibition areas on the roofs. And this is the helix stair. As you can see, you don't notice it at once, but you see it's actually two stairs intertwining. There's one here and one here, and they kind of go like that together. So if you buy a ticket, you can take this stair. If you don't buy a ticket, you can take the other one. And the one where you don't have a ticket connects you to the cafe and a few other facilities. And the other one connects you to the actual exhibitions. And this copper stair is placed inside of a mirror space, again. And that's what creates sort of this dissolved kind of, of atmosphere. But this is actually a rather big space. And then again, it has really narrow passages because when you actually walk between the stairs, some of it goes down to a height of 210, which is kind of just, just above. So it, it narrows down and it opens up again. And children actually love this space. And it's not a small space, it's a big space, but they love it. And one of the ways today that you can actually kind of evaluate the success of your own building is on Instagram. You go on Instagram and you write experimentarium, and you'll see photos by teenagers and parents, and you'll see like kids hanging from the stair or whatever they're using it for. And you can see they're having a good time and they want to share that with their friends. So that's a very good way to kind of um, to spy on your, your users after you leave the building. Uh, so this is the stair from, seen from the top. Now this is what I've been aiming for the whole time with this project. Because these are just giant big spaces. As you can see they're pretty shitty the way they are carried out. Just cheap uh, shitty spaces with visible uh, ducts and everything. And the HVAC is also visible. So within that space the experimentarium building little houses, almost like a little village. Um, and all of these represents different kinds of sciences teaching the children about how to mix liquids or how to work with acoustics and all sorts of things. So in this case, we've just provided the frame for the client to actually build this little village inside of our project. And in fact, the, the experimentarium, they have a crew of 15 people just building and rebuilding all the time. Uh, architects, designers, carpenters, together they build all these things. They're really good at it. They build stuff like this as well. This is, a, I don't know what you call it in English, it's like a track for a ball that it keeps going and you can change the track and see how acceleration works and, and all of this. And it just shows that within these giant spaces you have a big degree of uh, intimacy and of course a lot of interesting experiences. And here you see the kids in this mirror stair, this is the scissor stair. See, the kids are just lying on the ground. This is something we didn't anticipate because it's a stair that's clad with mirrors. So they're lying on the ground in the middle of the space, just looking at the, <laughs> looking at the stair. So sometimes um, a gesture within the architecture that actually meant for, you know, just for, the, uh, just for the experience actually creates a little space or a little activity for children. And this has become a popular place to lie on the ground and and do all sorts of things and see it mirrored and take pictures of yourself. So we saw this on Instagram as well. This is the last, uh, we're probably also running out of time. Are we okay? We're okay, good. This is the last uh, project. This is a big competition that we won in, uh, in the UAE. And uh, we, were in, we were invited to this one because of the other one I showed you. And the other one we got invited for because we did a tiny little kindergarten in in, uh, in Vonsil in Denmark. And that was published in a Chinese book that landed on a very powerful uh, person's table in Abu Dhabi. And she invited us along with three other companies uh, from the US and uh, from Doha and so on. And we actually managed to get the commission. And she really liked uh, working with us and therefore she invited us to this competition. It just all kind of grew from one tiny kindergarten. So that's also a story of, of big impact from a small building that turns into bigger, bigger commissions. But anyway, this is, um, this is a revitalization of um, a very important site in Abu Dhabi, which is a square site in the center of the city. And it's placed right here. This is the cornice facing the gulf. 
And this area has two really important buildings. One building is the old fort. And the first part of the fort was built in, nine, in 1763. And it's kept growing since then. Also, again, a perimeter building with a new perimeter and a new per perimeter, which is typical for fortresses. Um, and then also on the side, there's this long building, which is the cultural foundation building. And that is, um, that's a library, a music theater, and some um, exhibition spaces put together in one building. And actually, a few years ago, um, the city considered actually tearing this down, but there was a lot of people that were kind of against it. And there was a big debate on Facebook because a lot of the people of Abu Dhabi have really fond memories of this building. They met in this building, some of them, and got married in this building, and they saw their first school play in this building. And the country, as I told you, started developing in the 60s and became officially a country in 71. So this building, even though it's from 1980 or something, it's a really old building in this town. In my town, that would be a new building, but here it's an old building. So it does have sentimental value, and a lot of people have really fond memories, so they wanted to keep it. And after deciding that, um, the client decided that this whole site should become an open park with these two main buildings sitting in the park. And we came up with this really, really simple concept of actually dividing the square space, it's a 400 meter by 400 meter uh, space, with a diagonal. So by creating the diagonal you make two kinds of, 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 of plazas or two kinds of spaces, one for the fort and one for the CFB. The space around the fort is pretty open, pretty bare and looks pretty much like a coastal desert. That has to do with putting the fort back in focus again because it was shielded off for a long time and nobody can really see the fort today. We wanted to open that up again and make the fort an important building in, in, the, in the city. And it used to stand on the sand as the first landmark you would see when you travel to the city from the desert. This was the first, I mean look at this, in 40 years this was the first building and the city was out here. Look at this now, and this is just part of the city. It's 20 times bigger than that. In 40 years, that's what you call rapid development. Um, so we wanted that feeling back for this one. So it's standing on a very open plain and basically there's no design around it. The fort itself is the main piece. And then on the other side of the diagonal with the CFB, we wanted to create a more uh, traditional park with shade, with the seating possibilities, running water, all of those features that you would need in a hot climate uh, park. So they are kind of contrasts. One is the, a bit like an oasis, the other one is a bit like a desert in a way. And you can see the diagonal here in the sketch as well. There's a water feature running also in the diagonal that runs around the sea. Well, actually on this sketch it did, we changed that anyway. But this is the first sketch and usually with the watercolors I do, those are done after the concept design. This one is done before, and I'm quite shocked to see how much it actually looks like the final design. We actually took it all the way to, to DD, looking pretty much like this. If you dive down into the details, I mean, if you, if you take out a section like this, you'll see that there's a number of possibilities within this Vogelnoy uh, type of structure. I know it's a very typical thing to do these days. I think every architect Every contemporary architect has done a Vogelnoy project or some, some, I don't know if you've done one, Nierich, but, but probably, yeah. Everybody does one, but we're actually building this one now. So, and it has a lot of possibilities and a lot of flexibilities. Um, it can grow in size and scale. It can grow in height. It can have different kinds of functions. It can just be paving. It can be a little plinth. It can be planters. It could be actually a building. And we are, in fact, introducing buildings on the site, but they're just hidden kind of hidden within the landscape so that the CFB and the fort is still the main attractions of the site. So the new buildings that we do are actually just part of the landscape and they kind of disappear. They're also small and that's why they're adequate for this, uh, for this theme. You have the CFB here and you have the fort and then these parts of the landscape that follows the diagonal. This is a mosque or a muzala as it's called, which, which is a kind of mosque that's a little more open it's in its uh, space programming. And this is a food and beverage facility facing the lake. So it's just a landscape that gradually arises and becomes buildings and have these really intimate spaces within a gigantic space and a gigantic city scale. Because if you look, let's go further, if you look at this image, you'll see that the buildings are quite tall. This is a Norman Foster project, the World Trade Center. I mean, huge buildings. 
But then in these guys, in this area, you have the intimacy of the really small, narrow spaces. You have the shade, have the sound of water, you're protected from the traffic around the site and so on. So it's intimacy within something very big. And I think that this is, somebody asked before, what should we do with cities, uh, small scale or big scale? I think this is the right solution. If you combine big and small, you combine uh, different kinds of densities together because the contrast is just thrilling. And you can see that on Manhattan as well. You have really small, intimate plazas. You go down one block and you have something gigantic. It's like walking in nature. You have a mountain. It's huge, but you can also find that beautiful rock right next to the mountain. That's the kind of, of experience we should have in our cities as well. Anyway, if we look closer at the landscape, I want to just point out this diagram particularly. It has a number of little spaces, 18 like a golf course, of these little green areas. There's not a lot of green in this, uh, in this site. As you can see, it's quite well, it's not barren because that's a negative word, but it sits well within the UAE region because doing something completely green, it takes a lot of water. And the water is a, an expensive resource in the region. They don't have a lot of water and it never rains. So actually planting trees is unsustainable, which is kind of upside down for the rest of us because we, we actually have associations with green as being something sustainable. Uh, here is the opposite. So you actually need to make a kind of park that is more sparse and more desert-like. It sits well within the aesthetics of the country, but it also is the right thing to do in terms of climate again. But anyway, we created little pockets, little green oases, little intimate little pocket spaces. And they look like this. There's just a number of them. There are more than these. And as you can see, these are people. So they're quite small. This one is quite small. This is smaller than a single family house. And it's just different combinations of three or four materials, a bit of concrete, a bit of sand, uh, a bit of water, just laid out in different ways. All of them Vohonois, but still very distinct spaces. So it's also about wayfinding. So it means that within this big space, you'll have shade, you'll have intimacy. And this is where you see the Vohonois blocks rising up to become a building just around here. But it just kind of merges into the landscape that has the exact right Abu Dhabi feel so once again, it's about creating something that sits well within this culture and this heritage. This is a heritage park, and there's a big heritage program. And also, some of these features should be appealing to children. Like Trini said before, there's, this, there's a water installation in Aarhus. It's just a number of, of, of fountains just spewing out of the ground. and just collects the children because they just love playing with it. I think whenever you add water, you can be sure that children will be you know, filling buckets and you know, walking out into the water. So, it's great for grown-ups to cool their feet or to just listen to the water, but it's also great for children to play. So for me, this is just as nice a playground as any pink uh, Disney elephant or whatever. This is, in fact, better because grown-ups also like to stay here. This is the plan of the mosque. You see, again, it consists of Vohonoi shapes, each, and each shape has a function. One of them is the main praying room. One of them is the praying room for the women. There are the ablution rooms before you go to pray, you wash yourself and all that. And each Voronoi has one function. And over here they kind of merge together and become one restaurant space. This is the food and beverage facility that is facing the lake. And from afar, this one I showed you before, you see the food and beverage area here with the shading canopies coming out. And this is the mosque with the minaret kind of pointing to the top. In any other town this would be a tall, this would be a tall uh, element, but down here it's not. Um, and then when you walk inside of, the, of, of these Vohonoi shapes, you see that they are repeated as an interior landscape. So once again, we work with intimacy and small scale. Some of these are actually uh, a chair you can sit on, but the whole space itself is also a Vohonoi. Some of them are skylights. And I know it's, I mean, it's a bit ob obsessive in terms of reusing and reusing and reusing the Vohonoi, but it's all about creating identity for the whole site. Um, I kind of long for the design we worked with in, in the 90s where you'd put together different kinds of elements and it seems that now many architects are obsessed with having these um, repetitive patterns and ideas becoming almost like a fractal disease in the projects. But it works really well here, I think, and it, it ties the interior together with the landscape. And this has to be a landscape because there are only two buildings on the side. The fort, which is the, like the main price uh, building, and then, of course, the CFB. This is the praying hall. Um, 
and we actually have a lot of daylight coming in, but because you have other Voronoi shapes in front of them, you can't look into the praying room, it's completely private, but you have a lot of daylight flowing into the space and being reflected in the water because these are pushed out into the water. We can just go back to the plan. Oh, here you see it. This is the Mosala, and you see the praying room is out in the water, and this is the block that's shading actual the main window at the end of the Kibla, which is the praying direction within the, within the praying room. And this is the, this is the um, food and beverage area, and you see sort of the passages here. And you can imagine, of course, this intimate, intimate space. It's two meters wide. It has a palm tree. And you walk out, and you have the city space of a 400 by 400, uh, which, is, which is quite a combination of intimacy and monumentality. I think monumentality is not a bad thing. It can be bad, but it doesn't have to be bad. If it's just the monumentality, it, it, might, it might be bad. But um, if you combine it with something that's uh, mid-scale or small-scale, it can work fantastically well. Uh, okay, I guess uh, there's one slide missing. Doesn't matter. Um, thanks for having me, and thanks for the chivapi, anyway. <laughs>
If you're hiring a musician, how would you know that if that musician is a good musician? You would ask him to play? If you hired a cook, you'd ask him, you'd ask, you'd, you'd taste his food? So even though it's kind of banal, the, the thing about giving people an original is that they just trust you immediately. Oh, this guy knows what he's doing. He's, he's been, you know, working a lot to achieve this level of, of handicraft. Yeah. So that, there's a lot of advantages to it. So we use it even more now than ever before. My only problem is that the office is getting so big. And we're doing so many things that it's difficult to, to draw uh, everything. There are other people in the office that draws really well. Uh, the new partner, Mikkel, I think actually, I hate to say it, he's actually better than me. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think I draw more drawings than he does, but he actually, I think he's a... I dislike admitting it, but they're actually better. <laughs> but anyway, he also uses that skill, and I think a lot of people in the office, they do that. But mainly my drawings are being published as part of our, um, as part of our work. But we all do it, yeah. Okay, well, I have a series of questions, but uh, I will let Milena to ask you something, and then I will continue. <laughs> Thank you, Igor. So, um, uh, Sebra made many design, uh, uh, many designs for buildings related to the education. Uh, the most of them are in Denmark, and investors are municipalities. Uh, on the other side, you may design for Russia and United Arab Emirates, uh, where investors are not municipalities. Uh, who gives you more freedom to make a breakthrough in traditional design of schools or buildings related to education? I, I think in, in general, when you work for a country or a city, a municipality or a nation, you would usually have more freedom because the money that are spent on the building belong to a community and not to one person. If you work for a private person who's spending his own money that he made himself, his cash, that person would want uh, a lot of influence. That's like the sort of, that's like the response you would, respect, you would uh, expect. And it also is correct for a number of, of um, situations. But I actually learned, um, I've been an architect now for 20 years and I've been practicing the whole time and, and building things and I think it all comes down to people more than actual organizations. And today a lot of contractors will not hire an office, they will hire a person. So if they come to us and they say, well, uh, we want to work with you but we want it to be that person on the team and we want it to be that partner. And if, that, if, if you're not going to do that, we're, we're going to look for somebody else. They don't want the company. They want certain people. Mm -hmm. I think that for me, uh, as an architect, the chemistry between two people is what really makes it work. And then that client can be the municipality or a private person or a king or whatever, it doesn't matter. If you really connect, that's where you make the magic. And you can't make brilliant architecture as an architect without a fantastic client. It's just impossible. And one of our best, or maybe actually our best client, I, I hope nobody will hear this because then they'll be disappointed that they're not the best client. <laughs> but one of our best clients is actually our client uh, in Abu Dhabi. Um, we just totally uh, connect on an intellectual uh, level. She totally understands what we want to do. We totally understand and respect what she wants to do with her country and the ambitions that she has uh, about developing this new uh, UAE architecture. And she really, is happy that we've been so enthusiastic about studying their culture and their history and so on. And we just completely uh, connect, not as a friendship, but, you know, intellectually. Uh, so that's one of the best uh, clients. And that's, uh, she's a private person uh, in that sense. Uh, but we've had uh, similar experiences also with the municipality where you find the right person that just kind of, it just works somehow. So it's about people more than organizations for sure. In general, if you want a good, um, if you want a good budget for your building, often working with a private investor is the best way to go. But I think uh, cheaper buildings can be just as fantastic as, expendi as expensive buildings. And I, I, use, I usually uh, tell people that the only building we ever had that made it to Wallpaper magazine, which is like an expensive posh magazine, that's one of our cheapest buildings. That's the Mirror Space, which is quite a cheap building. And um, so 
I think it's not really about the budget either. It's about uh, the people. Sorry for the long answer. Uh, one more question. Uh, you made Center for Marginal, uh, Marginalized Children. You made it as a home, not as an institution. Uh, do, do you measure if architectural design improved work of this institution? Like after once when you finish the building? This is, this is a very good question. And it's also, it, it just happens to be a very, um, it's a topic that we talk about a lot in Denmark right now. Because usually an architect will do, uh, maybe he'll do the brief, or maybe somebody else does the brief. Then you do the concept design and the preliminary design, and you do the detail design and tender documents. Then you build it and you have site supervision, and then the building is finished and you're out. Why not actually add the last phase, which is evaluation? All of the things we agreed on, do they work? Do anything we need to change? Should we redesign something? Should we learn for the next time we do a building? And we don't do that. And I think maybe a couple of months ago, I was at a seminar with one of the big foundations of Denmark. It's called Mask, which is a um, shipping, uh, shipping company, the biggest shipping company in the world, actually, which is, happens to be Danish. It's called Mask. And they also have a foundation for um, subsidizing uh, buildings and architecture. And the point was, sort of the outcome of this uh, seminar was we need to evaluate, we need to start evaluating because we claim that we do this and we claim that it works, but does anybody actually know? And in fact, with the children's home, we don't know, but the children's home became part of the evaluation that they just started. But I have to say with the children's home, we've had contact with, um, with the, the leader of the institution. So we do know a little bit. And one thing she told us was that the amount of conflicts between the children, because children will have conflicts like adults as well, uh, has decreased dramatically. So they have a lot fewer conflicts now in the new building. Nobody really knows why, because they don't have more space. It's the same space, but it's just a different layout of the building. So that thing works. But I also have to admit that the reason why she called us and she told us this positive thing was because she also had a negative thing that she wanted to discuss with us. And that's some of the rooms are getting overheated. So we're actually designing some uh, uh, shading devices for some of, the, some of the facades now. So that's both a good thing and a bad thing. But in terms of the pedagogical and social experiment, so to speak, things have worked out terrifically well. And all of the negative response we have is technical uh, issues about um, the interior climate and, and facade solutions and so on. Well, we could see that uh, you are actually experimenting, if I could say so, with, uh, with the architecture and you are and experimenting with educational system in some way because some of your buildings are able to, to change something. And uh, while you're doing that, that you are also playing with uh, with the architecture. So the question is: um, uh, Did you have a chance to influence or to, yeah, to influence the laws regarding the the education or to change something in the educational system after all this experience uh, in designing architecture for education? No. Nope. That's the short answer. I, I have to tell you, in, in terms of doing educational buildings, we are very fortunate to live in Denmark as architects because 15 years ago, there was a big program that was rolled out across the country where politicians decided that we needed to revitalize the education system because everybody seems to believe that education is the key to success in the future because particularly in Denmark, because we don't have any natural resources. We don't have oil, like in Norway, for instance, they have loads of oil. Basically, we don't really, we have bacon, but I mean, that's not gonna, <laughs> that's not gonna last forever. Um, so living off of the knowledge is very important, and therefore the education system has to be first class. And so there was a law uh, rolled out across Denmark, it was called, um, something like uh, schools of the future, or whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, and within that, um, there was um, some demands and some ideas on how to uh, run a school, how to lay out the spaces of a school, and so on. And in fact, they're doing it now in Germany. 
the same, the same thing, but 20 years later, 15 years later. And before, um, before Cameron came to power in the UK, when, um, what was the guy before him? Oh my God, that's embarrassing. Blair. Blair, yeah. When Blair was still around, they also had a School for the Future program in the UK, and they brought us over to actually uh, tell them about our experiences with building these new schools, what worked, what didn't work, how does it work when you dissolve the traditional classroom and make more open spaces and all that. And then Cameron came into power and he shut down the whole building schools for the future to just save money. So it's something that's happening in, in a few uh, countries now, uh, now in Germany. They are spending billions of, you know, for making new schools and for revitalizing existing schools. So basically our architecture is just an answer to that new political brief. So we are just lucky as architects to have visionary politicians. It's as simple as that. Um, I'm not sure that politicians could have imagined the solutions we came up with. Of course they couldn't. But we've not uh, changed anything in the laws or the education system. We've just sort of visualized or put the visions into something, into a physical shape. And what about uh, regarding the education of architects? What an architect, in your opinion, should be in, in the future? We, we heard on the days of architecture two weeks ago in Sarajevo, uh, there was a very interesting and very good panel about that. Uh, I don't know, will, maybe someone will correct me. Uh, it is Turato, or it was conclusion of debate, there said that uh, architect in 21st century should not be a designer of shapes or forms, but designer of social relations. And uh, yesterday we were heard uh, Hrvoje Niric, uh, who said that uh, uh, social media will change architecture completely. And today uh, Željko Kusić has uh, said that, uh, well, you, you couldn't understand him, but he said that uh, architect should be all in one, you know, a manager, designer, psychologist, sociologist, uh, what is your opinion about uh, future education of architects? Um, I don't know about the education, but I, I do know what an architect of the future should be, and I think an, architecture, an architect of the future should be anything he wants to be. That's the fantastic thing about architecture. You can be an architect in a hundred ways. You can uh, live off of uh, designing uh, farmhouses uh, for bacon production, as an architect, you can uh, work in the municipality giving uh, working uh, building permits. You can design social uh, uh, projects if that's your thing. If you have a desire to just do shapes and be more of an artist, you can do that. If you want to do zebra tunes, you do that. You can do, an, you can do whatever you want in your field. You have to kind of find your own passion. And I think once you find your passion, uh, that's when you get really good because usually you are good at what you like and usually you like what you're good at. So if you're really good at designing social relations, that's perfect. I think there's not one solution, but hundreds of solutions. And I think it's getting more and more because maybe a hundred years ago you'd say, well, an architect designs and build houses, full stop. And that just developed into maybe a bit more. And then today, wow, everything. I mean, a hundred years ago, we didn't even have architecture schools. It would just be a bricklayer who was a talented bricklayer who would design the building and build it at the same time. And then architecture schools appeared, and with architecture schools you had teachers. Because you can be a brilliant architect and a shitty teacher. You can be a brilliant teacher and a shitty designer. Or you can be both, of course, a brilliant designer and a brilliant teacher. You can be a number of things. And today the possibilities for an architect are they're just infinite. And I can see from my own career that I've shifted a few times myself in what interests me. Now I'm really interested in climate. And ten years ago I didn't give a damn about climate. Uh, and I've been really into user, user involvement, and I think I just had an overdose of user involvement. Now I need to take a break, and maybe in five years I'll be fresh and back again with user involvement. So also, I mean, even within your own person, you can do a number of things. Trina, my wife, just was a dean at the architecture school, and now she's back in the office uh, cranking out competitions. Mm, yeah, the num hundreds of possibilities. It's so exciting, actually. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's uh, share the passion of, of, about architecture. I'm sure there is a lot of questions from the audience. Yes, please, Nebojša. Uh, 
I even know our audience by names, you know. Yeah, that's fantastic. We are so well, small uh, circle. Okay. Uh, first, that was uh, truly inspiring. Um, I need to speak right after you now, so thank you for making it so hard for me to get up there on the scene just to prepare the crowd. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. I had the same. Uh, I had the same feeling after uh, Nirich yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> now you all collected and uh, never mind I just uh, noticed one thing about uh, two different projects uh, correct me if I'm wrong but I think they're both in Abu Dhabi the kindergarten with the uh, inner courtyard yes. and the other one uh, with the mosque yes correct um, one detail was interesting to me is uh, uh, two types of approaches it's more about uh, the form actually um, is it just maybe you can give us some comment is it just uh, because of the different function that you you had so many layers. I know it's a kindergarten and uh, diversity is also really good in uh, objects with kids, uh, buildings with children, sorry. Uh, but is it uh, just the way you do or was it a matter of context or function that you uh, choose to have so many layers? Like uh, when I saw the project of the kindergarten in Abu Dhabi, I was like, oh, the inner courtyard and probably everything in the building will be all about that courtyard. Uh, as a student in my works, I was always afraid, you know, if I had one concept of uh, buildings, for instance, now, if the house is full of ramps, then probably everything will follow that, you know. And uh, in your kindergarten, I saw, like, uh, the animals later and maybe some other types of designs in uh, bathrooms, etc. And uh, in, the, in that mosque, on that square, you had, like, uh, the followings of the form inside and outside. So maybe some comment on that. Thanks. Those, uh, the two projects are very different, even though they are both in, uh, in the UAE. Of course, they have similarities, for sure. They both uh, respond uh, architecturally and stylistically to, um, to the heritage of the UAE and the culture, of course, but in different ways. And, and that's partly um, the interesting thing about uh, working in a foreign culture, that you can, it, it becomes a kind of a fuel for your creativity, but you can use it in many different ways. But I think also that of course, working, with, working with, with, with children allows you to be a little more playful and a little more silly somehow. Whereas working with culture and working with preservation of an old building from 1763 needs a little more seriousness uh, in a way. I said, I think sometime during the lecture, I said that it's kind of weird that when you do facilities for grown-ups, you have to be serious and you have to quiet down a little bit. And when you work for children, you can play. In fact, it doesn't make sense because I think grown-ups also like colors and playful uh, spaces. Not necessarily in every uh, place they go, but for sure they will, will like something that's also expressive. Um, so we actually try to always be, be playful, but I think um, you can be playful also in different ways. I think, for instance, with the, with the Qasr al Hassan project, the revitalization around the fort and the CFB building, that's also very playful, um, but in this instance, it's not animals and sort of architectural jokes. It's more in terms of um, the variation. You play with the architecture yourself, and you play with the elements and the, the puzzle pieces of the architecture when you see how many ways you can combine them to make actually 18 different uh, pocket spaces. And I think also the whole idea of, of making um, a stylistic representation of the local landscape is also a playful thing, almost something you do in a Disney park, but we just do it very refined and uh, very elegantly and very much more well designed than a Disney park, much more quiet, but it's basically the same idea of turning uh, something from the nature into something that's cultural. So. I guess you're right, there are differences between the two projects, but also a lot of similarities at the same time. And we found out that when we do reference uh, within the Emirati culture, we usually reference to roughly 10 elements, one of them being the wind tower called Barajil. I've even picked up a bit of Arabic, which is very interesting, <laughs> being the Barajil, uh, and the Irish courthouse uh, called Bait al Sahil. We also uh, refer a lot to that, even in the Qasr al Hassan project as well. So it just means that these elements can be combined in hundreds of ways when you start looking at it. And also it has to do with what I said at some point, that when you start out as a young architect, you have the idea that you want to invent 
something completely new and you find out along the way that when you invent something, you kind of just recycle uh, what is already there. If you look at the staircase of the experimentarium, it's a spectacular stair, but it's still a stair and it has the steps that you walk on and it respects gravity and all of that. And you can even find old stairs that are spiraling. It's a spiral stair, it's, but it's just a new take on it that makes it fresh. Um, so that's another example of having very, very few notes and very few elements, and then you can do thousands of, of things with it. You got the microphone that was off. <laughs> Oh, yes. Okay. Hi. Uh, you talked with Milena about uh, effects after the projects and how people reacted. But I see that you had uh, like a lot of profile user, different profiles in users. So, and I see that you got to know a lot about them and like uh, in every aspect and you predicted, it's not about you, you did test it, your, their reaction with your architecture you did you did uh, some experiments but i see that you did like you predicted every their uh, every their actions in in these spaces so for example the the foster foster home the beautiful thing that you did you gave uh, children a uh, chance to draw uh, their imagination of a home so that's one one aspect of knowing a user so i'm wondering what what are your uh, pro procedures or uh, s ways of getting to know the users? Actually, we, sometimes we, we are wrong, obviously. <laughs> because you, you are right, sometimes you don't know the users of your building. Let's say you're building 100 flats and then the person who owns the building will sell the flats. You don't know who's going to live in the flat. So you're designing for some abstract average person. Sometimes you design for a family and you get to know the family, the mother and the father, you get to know the children, you know the child is into football or whatever, you know everything and you know there needs to be space in the garage for a canoe because they, that's their hobby, whatever, you know everything about them. That's a different situation. But when we work for people that we don't know, I guess we just try to use our own personal experience as a person. For instance, uh, like my wife and I talked about today, if you look at a balcony and there are tables next to the edge of the balcony and there is a second row and a third row, the first row at the edge always fills up first. Why is that? That's because it's the nicest place to sit. You have the view, you feel you're a little bit uh, on your own, you, don't have any, you only have neighbors to one side and the view to the other. So there are some really basic psych psychological things that we have to study as architects. If you look at a plaza, you'll see, okay, people sit over here. Why is that? Oh, that's because the cars are on the other side and there's a shade. Okay, so people like to sit in the sun, at least in Denmark, people will sit in the sun. So you learn a few basic rules and from that you can predict stuff. But you also predict wrong quite often as an architect. I love it when people use our buildings in a way we never expected. It makes me very happy actually because it means that you invented a machine and it can do this, but then, wow, it can also do that. I didn't even know that. So we invented a machine that was even better than you thought. That's fantastic. And then sometimes uh, they just don't work. I have a silly example from the dormitory. I didn't tell you about it, but we put the numbers for the rooms on the floor, actually. So instead of having it on the door, we put them on the floor. Um, I can't even remember why anymore. Probably just because architects always want to do something else than the traditional solution, of course. And then often you find out, okay, there's a reason for the tradition. But anyway, we put the numbers on the floor, and then it turned out that half the students, they take the doormats and they put it on top of the number because they want to wipe their feet because they enter their uh, room, and then you can't see the number. So that's one of the, one of the examples where you actually do something and it turns out there was a stupid prediction that people would respect the fact that you can't put anything in because of fire regulations. You're not even allowed to put your shoes in the hall, but only architects know that, so <laughs> nobody gives a damn. Um, so in terms of predicting, you, you just have to use what you already know. Stupid things like uh, 
It's unpleasant to sit in the rain when you eat. It's much nicer to sit under a little roof, <laughs> you know, stupid things like that, and apply that in your building. And I think it's sometimes as an architect, I'm a little embarrassed with our whole community of architects because we all, also myself, sometimes we actually forget really elementary stupid things like that. And we design something that looks really cool, and then we, forgot, we, we forget one thing that is just like incredibly obvious. Um, and I think that's one thing we have to train as architects to remember to also just think about stupid everyday practicalities and then not let that rule our design. We should still be artists, of course. Architects are, it's, 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 we are artists when we design buildings. It's an art form, but it doesn't have to be a contradiction between practicalities and the artistry. Thank you. Okay, and who will win the last question for this uh, part? Yes, Vernes, please. Uh, hello, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I think uh, it is particularly relevant and useful to have you here as a speaker in a country where I think we have a generational gap between young architects developing new ideas and new ways of thinking and an older generation who, who has this different way of thinking, let's say. Uh, how? So I have two questions. One is uh, related to education uh, in a place where we have this generation gap. How important is it, do you think, for architects to still be educated in uh, ancient ideas of architecture, ancient Greece, Rome, and so on? Uh, and uh, the, the second question is connected to this. Uh, which is this idea of an architect as the, the kind of dominant controlling uh, agent in a, a, a team who is building a building. Uh, do you think the architect is, is actually has a new role in the industry and the field? Uh, and yeah, maybe you could comment something on this. Okay, uh, about uh, the ancient architecture. <laughs> When I was a student, I started architecture school when I was 18 years old. That's very young, actually. And I finished when I was 24. And we actually were taught just a little bit about ancient temples and stuff. And I was just like, oh my god, what the fuck? I mean, <laughs> you know, I want to listen to Corbusier and Peter Eisenman, all this hip shit. And then when you actually get older, you begin to understand, wow, that's actually pretty amazing what they did 3,000 years ago before you were even born. They did stuff that's much better than what you will ever do with tools that are way more primitive, no electricity, no computers, oh my God. I mean, when you actually start to study it, it's quite amazing. But I think you have to be older. I'm just beginning now, actually. I'm 45, I'm just beginning to actually kind of understand all, all of the temples and all. And I also remember in high school, we were taught um, the texts of uh, Homer, you know, the Greek uh, mythology. I hated it. It was just painful. And now I'm actually reading it because I want to. <laughs> and I actually think it's really good. <laughs> and uh, I'm reading Shakespeare on the way here and o o Ovid. And it's just, I wouldn't have never imagined that 20 years ago. Actually, I didn't want to read books at all when I was 20. I hated reading books. I picked it up when I was 30. So the question is, for sure we can learn about it. And for sure there are a lot of knowledge that dates back 3,000 years. And it's arrogant to think that we are much smarter today. It's just totally arrogant. The question is, when are you mature enough to actually get it? When are you? I, I had to be 40 before I actually started sort of looking in that direction. Uh, maybe other people mature uh, earlier than I do and can take it up earlier. But I think most architecture students are just not ready for it. Um, so maybe a short introduction they will be left there in the back of their head for another 10 or 20 years, just so they know it exists, and they, they can, then they can pick it up later themselves. So not a lot of it, and not every day, and not, it shouldn't be put up there as the most important thing, but just a short introduction, I think, would be, um, would be very adequate in architecture school. About uh, the architect being sort of a ruler, I think it, it, it goes back to the other question, because an architect can be a total dictator. And sometimes it works just perfect when that architect is a genius. And there are architects out there who are geniuses. I had the, the pleasure and the honor of working for Peter Wilson in the office of Bollis Wilson 
And Peter Wilson is just a genius. It's as simple as that. It's the only person I've ever known face to face. Uh, I've only met a known person who's a genius person. And you know, when you meet a genius, you know it. Uh, I'm sure uh, Steve, Steve Jobs was also a genius, but I don't know him. I've never met him. I've never met Albert Einstein or any of those guys. But I've met Peter Wilson, and he is just amazing. And when you have a person like that, you need to give that person the respect of just dictating everything. Because there's no choice that you can do better than him. He is just the man. And I was amazed in the office because he would just, in such a short time, he would treat every problem in a new way. And he would come out of his little office and open the door and say, this is, do it like this. And you'd just be like, wow. You'd be proud to just trace his, his sketches and to just build them. It was amazing. So a person like that should have the space to just be a genius. I think for, for the rest of us, we need to just be part of a team somehow and to be maybe the captain on the boat or whatever. But yeah, but still, you are dependent on other people with uh, different skill sets. And I think particularly in really big projects like uh, the library of Aarhus, the Doc One library, that is such a huge project that an architect for sure cannot know everything. And even if he knew everything, let's say you were an expert on robot parking basements, as well as an expert on children's libraries, as well as an expert on landscaping. Let's just imagine that. Would you have the hours of the day to design everything? No, it would just not possible. So you need a big team of architects and designers just sitting around doing the drawings. And in that instance, the architect becomes sort of a facilitator that makes it all work and talks to people and connects the engineer with the landscape architect and you know, when there's, when there's a conflict, maybe you discover it. So I think, if not a dictator as an architect, then a very central person within the organization of building. And usually the person that cares the most for the end result, the person that would just spend that extra hour to make sure that what the engineering, in, engineers are doing are not conflicting with what the librarians want and which is not conflicting with maybe what the traffic wants and all of that. You have the overview as an architect and it's just incredibly important. And then, I'm not going to talk forever. And I just want to make one point that occurred to me yesterday. <clears throat> I think because you said generation gap of architects, I think that um, the generation gap between um, generations is disappearing. I think the understanding um, we have between generations now is bigger than it was before. And I think the role of children is a different role now than it was 20 or 30 years ago. When I started in school in uh, 1977, I, I addressed my teachers by last name, I would say Mrs. Kohn and so on. I, I, to this day, I don't even know her first name. And then when I was 13, I moved to another school in a bigger town that was more modern and all of the teachers were addressed with the first name. I was just like, what? And uh, it just goes to show that everything is changing and it means that children are no longer, um, they, they are now considered individuals with an opinion and they are treated with more respect. So that's one thing that's happening. And you listen to children. If you go shopping with your kid, if he likes cucumbers more than apples, you'll buy cucumbers. He's part of the decision making in the supermarket. 30 years ago, my mother, would she ask me, she didn't even ask me what kind of clothes I wanted to wear. She would buy it for me, she said, put this on. I would feel like an idiot in these. <laughs> And it's just not, nothing to do. You just, you just do that because your mother uh, told you so. Today, it's not like that at all. You ask your kid, what do you want to wear? And they're like, I hate red. And then you don't buy a red sweater for your kid. Why would you do that? You'd be a sadist, you know? <laughs> um, and so I think at the same time, it also seems that people want to stay young a longer time. People are having children later and later. So the teenage lifestyle continues all the way into the 30s. And a lot of people in Denmark, they have children when they are 40 which is difficult in terms of fertility and so on, but people just want to stay young and free. And look at me, I'm 45, I'm wearing a teenage clothes myself and skateboarding t-shirts. I have, I have no right to do this actually, but I just, I just like it. <laughs> I'm kind of lying a bit to myself, I'm playing uh, young. And I think f uh, when I was a kid, a guy at four, 45 was a really old person. And 45 is 45, but I still think today that I listen probably to the same music as the young kids in my office. And I go to the same concerts as the young kids in my office. And I actually buy the same clothing as the young kids in my office that are 25 or 28. 
So the generation gap is, is disappearing, I think, and that's a global trend. 